everyone. Thank you for joining us for Joy in Our Town. I'm Aaron Motley. Joy in Our Town brings you information regarding the issues and problems we face in our local community in hopes of finding some solutions. On today's program, we have with us on the first segment, Mr. Bill Gilliard, and he is a motivational speaker and he is the assistant chaplain at Julian Tutwiler Prison. Now, he's sometimes known as the Think Big Man, and recently he's been thinking about some big ideas to help the prison system. So we thank you so much for being with us on the program today. It's a real and pleasure. And to share with us some of the ideas that you have uh, for the prison system. But first of all, I'd like you to just tell us what you do there at Julian Tutwiler as a chaplain. One of the things that I do is I uh, have a program every Wednesday night uh, where I teach the, the ladies to think big. Mm -hmm. and, and as a matter of fact, it's called the Think Big segment. And um, I actually preach. Mm -hmm. Well, I get a chance to preach as well as teach and, and reach the people for Jesus. Uh, Think Big is a very simple acronym, which means believe in God. Mm -hmm. uh, I get down to the basics when it comes to getting them to understand that if there's going to be change in their lives, there's absolutely no way to get around it. You need to face up with God. I and see. so that's what I do on Wednesday nights, but on uh, Sunday mornings, I'm there just as a chaplain okay. while someone else might be doing the program. Okay. Now, while you were serving there as a chaplain for the past few years, how long have you been serving for? Uh, at, at Tutwiler, I've yes. been working uh, there at Tutwiler for two years. Okay. For two years, I worked in the MIU unit where, where the ladies are HIV positive. Okay. And so I worked there nearly two years before I got an opportunity to come out to the big chapel. Okay. <laughs> well, now, since you've been working in the uh, prison system as a chaplain, you've come across some uh, things that you, you've seen where there have been some problems that, that you're seeing that, that's happening over and over. I want you to tell us about these problems that you're seeing, and then we're going to get into looking at some solutions. What, what are some of the big problems that you've seen in the prison system? Well, one, one of the things that um, I discovered is that many of the ladies in the chapel services had been in prison two, three, four, five, up to seven times. One person said, this is my seventh time. Wow. And so uh, we discovered that recidivism is a serious problem at Tutwiler Women's Prison. Mm -hmm. now, I had heard this term uh, many, many years before, mm -hmm. but this is the first time that I was in a setting where I'm talking, teaching, preaching the gospel to people, and I'm seeing them going back, doing the same things week after week, coming back week after week to, to face uh, the altar, face God at the altar over the same problem. So uh, repeating offenses is a serious problem with those that are behind bars. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, since recidivism is a problem, and it is not just a problem in Tutwiler Prison, you're, we're seeing that all over. And so, you know, when we're, when we're seeing people getting out of prison, going back in, getting out and going back in, and yet we're finding that, uh, that prisons are overcrowded, and we're seeing, uh, you know, even the, the government is talking about some of these things, well, do we need to build other prisons or do we need to do something about uh, the ones that we already have, uh, you're starting to come up with some ideas to, to help uh, turn this situation around. What, what kind of ideas uh, have you been working on? Well, th there are several ideas that I have in mind. Number one, uh, we want to deal with uh, what we may say is the problem or what's not the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, what, what is the problem? The problem is people aren't solving their crime problem while they're in prison. Mm -hmm. In other words, while they're uh, they are serving their time, something should happen, something needs to happen, but for some strange reason, it's not happening to the overwhelming majority of the people who are incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Number one, uh, in my chapel services, I have between 150 and 180 people that will come on a regular basis. They are really involved. But at that prison, there are over 1,100 um, prisoners there. Mm -hmm. And so look at 
the large disparity between those who come and those who do not come. Mm -hmm. And so you have large numbers of people who are complacent, who um, are just accepting the fact that they can't really change. And mm -hmm. so nothing's really happening in terms of real change happening in their lives because they, are, they just don't believe that they can be different. Mm. They're not giving themselves a fair chance, mm -hmm. okay? okay. Uh, the other problem is that people uh, have problems with drugs and alcohol uh, prior to coming and that continues to go on uh, while they are there. Okay. You wonder how are they able to get a hold of substances while they're in prison and for the life of me I don't understand it. Mm. Uh, and so I'm shocked by numerous things. For instance, um, it was an eye-opener for me to discover that um, homosexuality or gayism was a prominent or prevalent problem at a women's prison. Mm. And, and so I'm asking myself, how? And um, they're saying, wake up. Yeah. Um, this is a problem, mm -hmm. and it's real. Mm -hmm. And so many of the problems that people are having behind the uh, outside in the free world, they're continuing right while they are there. Yes. And they are not taking it serious in, in terms of seeing change come in their lives. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so now uh, when we, we're seeing people, sometimes they'll, they'll be released from prison right. and they go back out into society for a period of time. Sometimes they'll return. But what happens with a with a person who has been in prison for a period of time, 15 years or more, and then they get out, what, what are they coming out to face? Well, they're, 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 they're coming out to face the real world. Mm. The, and the real world is they are waiting for you. And basically, they are saying, hey, we've been waiting for you. It's mm. like going um, back home and you hadn't been home in three or four years. Your family is happy to see you yes. with, with arms wide open. <laughs> they are embracing you. And this mm -hmm. is basically what the real world is saying. Mm -hmm. And so when they go back, the old friends are saying, come on, things haven't changed very much. And if mm -hmm. things have changed, we're just glad to see you. We'll bring you up to speed and we'll just get back to things as usual. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's the thing that we have to try to solve prior to them leaving. Number mm -hmm. one, they must experience some significant change in their lives. Mm -hmm. They must understand some basics about um, what must happen if they are not going to come back. And one of the biggest things that must happen is that they must develop new friendships. Mm -hmm. Sounds to me like you're saying that there were some arms that were open to them, and now they need some different arms exactly. that will be open to them. And that's and one of the things that we want to do. We want to raise the awareness of the community okay. to say that these people are coming out, and uh, they need a fair chance. They mm -hmm. really need a fair chance by being able to become a part of friendships, being able to become a part of families and organizations that prior to um, they were not involved with, but now those organizations are going to go the extra mile in order to embrace them. Mm -hmm. Well, I can imagine there may be some people out there right now who are saying, well, why should we care? These are prisoners. Well, why should we one care? of the reasons why you should care is because these are the same people that are going to commit crimes against their families, mm -hmm. their communities, and quite often they'll leave their communities and come to yours, mm -hmm. and, and they'll get to you eventually. Mm -hmm. And so you ought to be concerned because they are going to commit more crimes and go back, and it's going to cost the, the, the taxpayers dollars again, all over again. Mm -hmm. Now, tell me, what, what can a person do or an organization do? How can they... Uh, keep this uh, person who comes out of prison uh, from uh, getting back involved in crime. What are some of the things that uh, can be done? You know, one of the things that can be done is that they can invite them to come to church. They can invite them to come to prayer meeting. They can invite them to get involved with uh, a Bible study. They can invite them to be a part of a small group. Um, for instance, uh, at any large church, a person could get lost very easily in the crowd, but they need to be a part of a small group that they can identify with and a, and a group that will get to know them personally. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, that, 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 that's a big step in the right direction just to get them to be a part of a small group that they can identify with people who uh, are touched by the feelings of their problems and their infirmities just like um, where Jesus is touched by uh, the feelings of our infirmities. Yes. And so 
that that's so important, belonging to a small group that makes you feel that you're a part of a family. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is that people need jobs. Mm -hmm. And they need someone who cares enough to say, look, I, I, I'm going to stick with you until you find a job. Mm -hmm. That means that you may know uh, someone in the church may know someone who uh, is a small business owner mm -hmm. that will really take someone serious and give them the chance that they need to get started all over again. Mm -hmm. You may just be a person who knows many people and you will get as serious about helping this person get a job as you would if this were you. Mm -hmm. Now that's, that becomes extremely important. Yes. The reason why I say that is because I've been working with a number of people mm -hmm. who've gotten out. Yeah. And basically what has to happen is that you've got to grab them by the hand yes. and you've got to lead them. Yes. You, you've got to say, come on, this is what we're going to do. And, and uh, after you've knocked on a certain number of doors, they get tired. They're wondering why things aren't going like they should be going. Yeah. And But you as a matured person, you have to understand that it takes time mm -hmm. and you've got to be willing to go all the way with them. And mm -hmm. when they see that you really care enough, right. you're concerned enough, that will change attitudes by itself. Mm -hmm. And how can this then uh, deter crime or, or reduce crime? If we reduce recidivism, then how is this going to reduce crime? Well, the, the two are, are directly um, related. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you can get a person to make a decision to obey the law and do what's right and uh, get a job and provide for themselves and for their family, uh, the greater the chances are they are not going to steal mm -hmm. or they are not going to rob a bank mm -hmm. or they are not going to uh, rob someone or, or yes. break the law. Mm -hmm. And as a result of not breaking the law, you're not confronted with being apprehended by the law and going right. back to prison again. Yes. Now, let, let me say this real quickly. One of the um, greatest challenges is not... Um, committing a crime uh, directly per se, mm -hmm. you'd be surprised to know the number of um, people who are back in prison simply because they, um, uh, they failed in the area of their probation. Okay. In other words, um, they are on probation mm -hmm. and they are not supposed to uh, be caught with dirty urine. Right. Yeah. They're not supposed to be using drugs yeah. again. And mm -hmm. so when I, 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 I'm sorry to cut yeah. you off, but there's another question I want to get okay, in real okay. quick. we got just a few seconds, and that is, uh, there are many people who are probably willing to help and to right. do something, but how will they know? Do you have some ideas quickly of how people can really know who's getting out of prison? How can I get a hold of that person? Yeah. Can you know, they just contact you yeah, and they, you can give some ideas? They can contact me or the chaplain okay. at Julia Tutwiler Prison, and, and that number is 5674369. Okay. They know the people who are getting out as well as the warden. Okay. At that same number, 567-4369. Okay. Uh, All right, and I guess this is where you come in as a motivational speaker. You can come and even talk to churches, agencies, organizations, and let them know how they can help the prisons, prisoners even further. Exactly, okay. and, you, and you can contact me as well okay. at 334-356-6492. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Mr. Bill Gilliard, for joining us today on Joy in Our Town, and we thank you for all the work that you're doing. We are out of time for this segment, but we will We'll be back with more of Joy in Our Town right after this.
Thank you for joining us for this portion of Joy in Our Town. We have with us Susan Moss, and she's the executive director of Crime Stoppers in this area. And she's going to talk to us about a scholastic Crime Stoppers program that will get students involved in stopping crime or at least reducing crime in this area. We thank you so much, Susan, for thank joining you. us on Joy in Our Town. And I'd like to really find out more about the Crime Stoppers program altogether. If you can give us a little background of how it started and, and what it is overall. Okay. Uh, well, Crime Stoppers in general started in Albuquerque, New Mexico in 1976. Mm -hmm. and But our chapter here in Montgomery has been around since 1997. Uh, TV reporter Beth Jett started it up with WSFA TV, and it has just grown since then, and we're now a nonprofit organization. Okay. Now, in this time that you've been serving with Crime Stoppers, uh, what kind of results have you seen as far as uh, reducing crime? Oh, it has been phenomenal, uh, especially this past year. Every year we seem to get a little bit bigger. Mm. Uh, this past year alone, we had 144 tips called into our crime tip hotline, mm -hmm. and we helped law enforcement in the Tri-County area solve over 102 cases. Wow. Well, that is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, can you get more specific about exactly how it operates and, and what, what are you doing? I, I don't suppose you're going out there like detectives and, and uh, fighting crime in that way or no, superheroes, um, but uh, just tell us how it works. We are trying to deputize the citizens. Um, okay. Uh, it's, it's really simple. Basically, there are more citizens out there than there are law enforcement officers. Mm -hmm. And crime is everyone's problem, not just law enforcement officers. So what we do is offer an anonymous crime tip hotline where people can call. Their issue is secret code. No one ever knows their name or their mm -hmm. phone number. Mm -hmm. And if their information proves helpful in solving a crime or making an arrest, they get a cash reward. Mm -hmm. um, so we overcome apathy and fear of retaliation by offering both of those things. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do work closely with all the law enforcement officers in the Tri-County area, and it has just grown into a great relationship. Right. And uh, like I said, it's everyone's business, not just law enforcement officers to try and curb crime. Mm -hmm. We all need to take an action role. Mm -hmm. Before Crime Stoppers, can you remember how it was with most citizens as far as how would they report crimes or would they just not get involved? What, what was going on before Crime Stoppers came well, along in this um, area? Actually, a lot of the law enforcement agencies have secret witness hotlines. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them are recordings, though, and I think a lot of the time, um, you know, people do, you know, they can find out who they are, you know. I'm not sure exactly how those operate, but ours, you know, we try to have a live person answering it. It's not a law enforcement officer who's taking the information. Mm -hmm. It is myself or a volunteer from our board of directors who is taking the information and passing it on to law enforcement officers. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that helps the citizens be, you know, a little bit more comfortable with calling in our hotline. Plus, it's easy to remember, 215-STOP. Mm -hmm. And there's all these other different secret witnesses lines. So, mm -hmm. Okay. What kinds of things have you seen happening as a result? I know you, you mentioned how some of the crimes have, have been reduced in that period of time. But uh, as far as some of the feedback from citizens, have you have you really heard some feedback from citizens that would really uh, let you know this is, this is really a program that is worthwhile? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, we hear all the time. And, you know, a lot of our citizens who call in, they actually decline a reward. Mm. Um, a lot of them just call. They just like the opportunity to where they can call in and remain completely anonymous. Mm -hmm. um, we do not take their name, and we do not keep any records of that. We just keep the code records, and that's it. So there's no way of them ever being called to court or anything like that. And I think that's what I keep a lot of people um, not to get involved is mm -hmm. the fear that they will be called to court or the person will find out who called in. Mm -hmm. um, so we take special special efforts to make sure that that does not happen. So I think the, the community really appreciates that. Okay. Now I understand that you're moving into some other areas and getting other people involved, such as students in junior high school, for instance. Uh, tell me, why is it important to get young people involved in reducing crime? Uh, because they need to learn at an early age how to be a good citizen mm -hmm. and that it is their duty to help take an active role in reporting crime. Mm -hmm. um, and the students are so responsive to this program. Mm. And what we do is the same hotline number, 215-STOP, we take to the schools. It, it can start at any school, but right now we currently have 16 in the Tri-County area. Okay. Um, but we let the students know there is a safe outlet for them to report crime without their peers finding out who it is. Because as you know, in school, you know, you can get 
really ragged hard by your friends and you know yes. called a snitch or other things like that mm -hmm. and uh, we offer three up to $300 cash reward for information from students about vandalism, mm -hmm. drugs, mm -hmm. weapons, um, and even bullies because bullying is the biggest problem in schools. Wow. After talking to all the students, uh, bullying is a really big problem. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is really going to uh, help the schools and the, and the young people, especially uh, in light of the Columbine situation a while back and, and maybe they can feel a little safer knowing that that we have another system here where we can report some suspicious situations that's going on or some of the things that we know it's happening in our schools. That's right and we also encourage the schools uh, not only you know to the students can call our anonymous tip hotline but we also offer you know have them to have an anonymous tip box mm -hmm. and other ways that students can report crime um, and yes I think I think that it's great for students to have this and and the kids who are out there making trouble they need to look behind their back Mm -hmm. Because now, not only, you know, in the past was law enforcement and the teachers trying to look at them, but now every student in the school is looking and can call in anonymously. Mm -hmm. So all the kids out there making trouble need to think twice before they do something because somebody's going to be watching and somebody will call and tell. Okay. Now, I'm sure you have some kind of training program that will help the students know what to watch out for and how to report and also to make sure that they're not calling in some kind of a prank calls. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us uh, what kind of a system you have in place to train them. Uh, well, actually, we just tell the students to call if they see any illegal activity on the school grounds or in their neighborhoods, too. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes we do get prank calls, but not that many, um, which is, you know, you would think that I would get a lot, but we really mm -hmm. don't. I think the students take it seriously. Mm -hmm. But each tip that is called in is fully investigated, mm -hmm. um, you know, in case the student is calling in just to get even with somebody about something oh. that did not happen. So when we get the tips, we do call it into the school officer who does fully investigate investigate it okay. um, before we do anything else about that. So we do have things in, in place to stop, you know, any pranks or things like that. Okay. What kind of response have you gotten from the students now that uh, this has been put in place in a few schools already? Um, have, have, have they uh, mentioned anything about, um, wow, I'm so glad that we're involved and this has happened and this deterred some crime? Uh, what have you seen? I think that they feel more safe and okay. I think they feel like they have a safer learning environment mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, crime costs money, you know, yes. for a lot of schools and it takes away from a student's education. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't. Th I think that everyone deserves a good education. Mm -hmm. And if a teacher is constantly having to, if the classroom is always being disrupted by fights going on or things like that, you know, that takes away from that. So I think the students are really getting a safer, um, happier education, and they're they're not afraid to go to school. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now this is Crime Stoppers Month, the That's month right. of January, yes. and you can tell us a little more about uh, what's what's been going on uh, throughout the month, and uh, what kinds of uh, programs have you implemented, and also uh, talk about the, uh, the the type of ways that that you all are getting information out to the public. Um, well, the mayor, Mayor Bobby Bright, signed a proclamation for us this month, and mm -hmm. so did Governor Don Sigelman. And uh, so it is Crime Stopper Month every January, mm -hmm. and we had, uh, we're, like, we had the Scholastic Crime Stopper Assembly at Georgia Washington Junior High last week. Mm -hmm. And um, next week, we are having a Youth Crime Watch Scholastic Crime Stopper kickoff at Wetumpka Junior High and Wetumpka High School. Okay. Um, so those are some really things that we're working on right now. And uh, we've had some articles recently in the Montgomery Advertiser talking about our program. So we're just trying to get the word out in general to the public that this program is available. Um, and it's a great program. Mm -hmm. And um, the best thing about the schools is it's free. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't cost the schools anything. We mm -hmm. come in, we pay the rewards and everything. And plus, it teaches the kids crime prevention. We like to give them other literature, you know, as far as, you know, crime prevention, bus safety, 
bullies, you yeah. know, things like that. And um, also Scholastic Crime Stoppers is part of Youth Crime Watch, mm -hmm. um, which is a Department of Justice based program. Oh. Um, and we are having a training January the 31st. So any okay. school that is interested in coming to that training, um, please call 215 STOP and I can give you more information about that. Okay. Well, Susan, can you tell us more as far as the future for Crime Stoppers and what the goal would be uh, in the next five or ten years or so down the line, what, what would you like to see? Well, um, right now we are on our last year with a grant through ADECA that pays okay. for our operational expenses. Mm -hmm. um, so unfortunately I don't know what the future holds for Crime Stoppers at this moment. Mm -hmm. I'm very hopeful that the program, well I know the program will continue mm -hmm. even if on a volunteer basis because it is that strong in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as our funding goes, we're not quite sure and we're working on that right now. Mm -hmm. um, our funding with the DECA runs out in September. Okay. So we hope that something will come up and uh, that, it, that it will definitely continue on a full-time basis, not just a volunteer basis. Okay. Now if uh, Others would like to get involved. You, you did give a number earlier. Uh, just give that number if they'd like to call you, uh, find out more about Crime Stoppers and what you're doing and how they can get involved with it. Yes, well, they can call our tip hotline, 215 mm. STOP, and I'll be glad to answer any questions anybody might have. Uh, we are always taking donations from the public for our cash reward fund. Mm -hmm. um, so if anybody would like to donate any money or if anybody just wants information about our Scholastic Crime Stopper program mm -hmm. or our uh, personal safety forms that we do for the community. We go out and teach self-defense and personal safety, uh -huh. which is also free as well Wonderful. to organizations, groups, you know, communities, anything like that, neighborhood watches, we, we do all that. Okay. Well, that is just outstanding that you're, you're so very involved in, in all that. Real quick, um, uh, well, it seems like we are running out of time for this <laughs> segment, uh, but, uh, you know, when people are looking out, seeing things that uh, just don't look right in their community, they can give you a call. Yes, please. 215 STOP. Okay. Thank you so much, Susan Moss, for being with us thank on you. Joy in Our Town. All right. Well, we thank you for joining us for Joy in our town. That's all the time we have for now. Join us again next week at the same time. We'll see you then.